Some scientists consider a world in which we may have rubbed shoulders with a dinosaur equivalent as highly plausible. Dinosaurs on a spaceship. <laughs> Alan. I will not deny 20 million years of history and doctrine just because one insignificant saurian has a theory. Science fiction has a weird relationship with paleontology. Myself and hundreds of other people, a lot of whom I've met in person, study paleontology because they saw Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is a classic of the genre and an incredible movie in its own right, which takes some logical leaps to make its premise work, such as the half-life of DNA being incompatible with it surviving the 66 million years it would need to to be intact enough to be used for cloning, but which mostly served as a compelling story that, for the time at least, gave us a pretty up-to-date picture of what dinosaurs would look like, besides the whole, you know, no feathers thing. Jurassic Park is practically the platonic ideal of the use of paleontology in science fiction. It respects the science without letting it get in the way of the story. It uses dinosaurs to drive forward its central themes and the obvious metaphor for nuclear weapons without being too on the nose about it. And the science of paleontology is a core part of the story as well. It's the profession of multiple characters, and it's their motivations for visiting the park in the first place. Its sequels got away from this all eventually, with the Jurassic Park era designs of the Velociraptors in particular becoming dated and unscientific long before the Jurassic World movies insisted on not changing them one iota. And most unforgivably, just as a science fiction writer myself, the dinosaurs in the later movies stopped being characters in their own right, or even set pieces to move the plot along. Horror antagonists, as the Velociraptors were clearly framed as in Jurassic Park, and metaphor with the T-Rex's rescue of the main cast at the end of the first movie, standing in for the synthesis of some of the movie's core themes, that science can be used both for good and ill, that when used recklessly and without forethought, precautions and safeguards, it can be used for evil, even for murder, but that science and nature as its extension is neither good nor evil fundamentally. It just is. Okay, that, that might just be me. I'm sure Reddit's gonna have a field day with me for that one. But as you can see, I got a lot out of Jurassic Park, even decades after first watching it as a child, after growing up, after getting a PhD in paleontology, after having a career in the field and then leaving the field. That's the sure sign of a masterpiece. In contrast, a lot of the later films, especially the Jurassic World movies, barely use paleontology to their advantage at all. And even when dinosaurs show up on screen, they're often just used for spectacle. Every shot of a dinosaur in the original Jurassic Park movie is dripping with meaning. In Jurassic World, they play the triumphant musical sting from the first movie on an amusement park ride, where it loses all of its original might compared to its first appearance in the original Jurassic Park, where of course Alan Grant sees a living dinosaur for the first time where the musical sting actually captures the awe of that moment perfectly and takes the viewers along this journey with him. This man who studied dinosaurs his whole life, finally being confronted by the objects of his study and just... These two scenes put together are just a perfect demonstration of how to take everything that made a franchise possible out of a franchise. And as much as child me loved the original Jurassic Park trilogy, you could make the argument that this started the moment the original movie got a sequel, and the studio started its quest to match the sales of the original by cashing in on the name, regardless of how it treated the vision. But this video isn't about Jurassic Park. 
it's about Star Trek. Pepperoni. And Star Trek is an entirely different beast. In fact, it, okay, it, it's not about Star Trek yet, but it will be. But there's just one more stop we need to take along the way before I can get to the Star Trek of it all. Yes, that's right. The field rejected you. You published multiple papers and for what? Instruct the paleontology community in the matters of loss and pain. Make them suffer. But, but, Graham? Where, where did you come from? I, I thought I wasn't dealing with you till next week. I, I don't want anyone to suffer. I left paleontology of my own accord. Sure, I found it much harder to get work than a lot of straight white guys I know with just as few, if not fewer, accolades than me, but... You don't need to lie to me, Bridget Empire. I was rejected by my community too. I can teach you how to get back at them. Why would you help me? Wait, get back how? The park, Bridget Empire. First, we attack their park. Uh, I, actually, I, I already wrote the Jurassic Park segment. This next segment is actually about Doctor Who. This is why I hate you trans rights activists. You never, okay. Now, where were we? You are beautiful. Science fiction, again, has a weird relationship with paleontology. For many of us, science fiction is what got us into paleontology in the first place. But for every Jurassic Park, you get a Jurassic World. Okay, that's not fair. For every Jurassic Park, you get one of my least favourite episodes of Doctor Who of all time. And that show had an episode where the moon is an egg and also a metaphor for abortion. And that one time the whole episode was actually a defence of capitalism where the Jeff Bezos stand-in is an actual murderer, but it's fine actually because it's not the system that's the problem, it's the people that exploit it. The systems aren't the problem. How people use and exploit the system, that's the problem. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship is an episode of Doctor Who from Series 7 of the current run of the show, starring Matt Smith as the Doctor, a fantastic actor who would later play Violent Incest Man, prequel edition, in House of the Dragon, and do such a good job playing Fritz Philip in The Crown that I can't even look at him anymore without hearing the voice. This episode was written by future showrunner of Doctor Who, Chris Chibnall, who ran the show in the period in which Jodie Whittaker was the Doctor, and when the aforementioned Jeff Bezos' was Good Actually episode aired, though mercifully, Chibnall didn't ride that one, so he spared you all another tangent there. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship is a story about dinosaurs on a spaceship. That's actually a lie. The dinosaurs are completely inconsequential and are basically just there so you could call the episode Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. The dinosaurs look terrible. You could have removed them entirely from the story and nothing of value would have been lost. The story would have been beat for beat the same if you replaced them all with bees. And in fact, Bees on a Spaceship would be a much less agonising episode. And at some point, Matt Smith's Doctor rides a Triceratops and I start to want a Triceratop myself. I'm riding a dinosaur on a spaceship! I know! The Moffat era of Doctor Who is famous for smelling its own farts a little bit, but this episode just doesn't care for the science it wants to play with here. The dinosaurs are not, as in Jurassic Park, central to the story in terms of plots, character or theme. Whereas in good uses of paleontology and science fiction, they're utilising at least one of those things, if not all three. Now, I should mention here, because I've been pretty down on Chibnall and the Moffat era here, that I personally enjoyed all eras of Doctor Who in the modern era. In fact, out of my top three episodes of all time, there is a Chibnall one in there, and a Moffat one too, in fact. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship also implies that the dinosaurs that are on said spaceship are from the same time period as the Doctor Who alien species, the Silurians, which we will get back to later, even though this is a video about Star Trek. And you might notice that the Silurians are named after the Silurian period in Earth's history, which is 150 million years before the Mesozoic era, where dinosaurs evolved for the first time. And if you know anything about the species of dinosaurs they use in this episode, Triceratops was from the late Cretaceous period, 66 to 68 million years ago, closer to literally right now than the Silurian period. Now, there is an episode for the Third Doctor era in which the Doctor implies the Silurians are actually from the Eocene, which is much closer to now than the Silurian period. But the thing is, 
The Eocene begins about 10 million years after the KPG mass extinction in which all dinosaurs that aren't literally birds died out. And the dinosaurs in Dinosaurs in the Spaceship are not crows and pigeons and magpies as much as I would have liked that better. They're what you'd expect someone who just googled dinosaurs to come up with when deciding what to include in their D-tier Doctor Who episode. This episode just has no respect or even a passing interest in the science of paleontology, or even just dinosaurs in general beyond using it as a keyword to sell the idea of their episode. Star Trek is, I'm happy to say, better than this. Most of the time. And for all its faults in the handling of paleontology and on a broader scale, evolutionary biology, Star Trek is at least wrong in interesting ways. Ways that make you think, and that make me think. And also, is that, holy fuck, is that a fucking dinosauroid? You are beautiful. Hello, yes, that was a thousand word intro. Did I mean for this video to go off the rails so early? Fuck no. I sat down to write a short little video about the one episode of Star Trek with the dinosaur aliens, and then my fingers just started moving of their own accord like that hand thing from the Adams family, and my visceral hatred for dinosaurs on a spaceship compelled me forward like I was in my very own TARDIS, forcing me to talk about Jurassic Park to justify my distaste. Anyway, I swear to God that this is actually a video about Star Trek. Hell, I even got the greatest Trekkie of all time, Jesse Gender, on to talk about the intersection of Star Trek and paleontology, so look forward to that. Like, genuinely do look forward to it. I had a lovely time talking to Jessie, and she was very helpful for this video. Besides all that, however, hello, I'm Bridget Empire, and I'm finally doing some fucking science once again in my capacity as a science and culture correspondent for this here newspaper, The Daily Telegraph, the only newspaper in Britain that is so overflowing with culture topics that I've been able to avoid talking about science since I quit academia last year and got to the point where the idea of even looking at a test tube made me want to jump off a very tall bridge. Anyway, now I have sufficient distance from all that, and I get to talk about another one of my great loves while I'm talking about science. Science fiction. And Star Trek of all things. The show with the space communists in it. The space communists. That's me! <laughs> I knew that. Seriously, I'm a huge science fiction fan, and I'm currently writing my own science fiction novel featuring, wait for it, dinosaurs. Not on a spaceship, although there are spaceships involved, and they're all over the place actually. So when that comes out, eventually you can all re-watch this and point out exactly where I failed to meet my own standards of paleontology and science fiction. But for now, all you have to judge me on is this video. A video that is definitely about Star Trek and nothing else. I am Jesse Earl, aka Jesse Gender, um, on YouTubes, and I do uh, video essays about Star Trek and queer issues and trans issues, and uh, yeah, try and figure out a way to meld those many uh, those many uh, ideas into some form of coherent video essay on my channel. Trek has a weird relationship with evolutionary science. Well, with science in general, I suppose. It's not like most of the technobabble in Star Trek is steeped in some real theoretical science, although some of it certainly is. Sometimes there's a plot problem you just need to be solved, so Geordie adjusts the deflector dish to emit some particle that conveniently solves a plot problem in the same way the Doctor would famously reverse the polarity of the neutron flow just to make things happen. With evolution in Trek, however, it seems to me like a lot of the problems stem from the production of the original series, where special effects were very much in their infancy compared to the magic people can do with CGI today. And most aliens, therefore, were just humans with a single distinguishing prosthetic on their heads. Or alternatively, a guy in a suit. Doctor Who started out around a similar time, and if you've seen the original Cybermen, you'll see what people had to work with. And that show had to work with using fucking condoms and tinfoil, so you know, you work with what you have. One of the things that happens when you have a bunch of aliens from across the galaxy that all just look like humans, however, is that people are going to ask, shouldn't all of these species look wildly different? Hell, a lot of planets in Star Trek have what look like regular Earth plants, grassy meadows, familiar trees, even birds and other complex animals. Now the universe is a big place, so you could certainly expect to see convergent evolution a few times if there are enough places harboring life, but the sheer frequency of it is kind of odd here. Convergent evolution, for those of you who don't know, is the process with which distantly related species evolve similar adaptations to deal with similar problems and needs. For example, vertebrates have evolved wings three separate times, in pterosaurs, birds, and bats. All of these serve the same purpose, but evolved in different ways. Bat wings are adapted hands where the finger bones form the anchors for a skin membrane. 
Bird wings are adapted from the entire arm, with feathers forming the bulk of the wing shape. And in pterosaurs, the wings and membranes attach from the body to the end of an elongated finger. These are weird to look at side by side, but they all work the same way in practice. They serve the same functional purpose. In the same vein, you might well expect upright creatures with big brains and gripping hands of building things with, in space-bearing civilizations, presuming that you would need free hands to build ships with and don't just have space whales hanging out you can hitch a ride on. However, even just on Earth, you see animals with two limbs off the ground in a variety of shapes. You have birds that evolved from non-avian dinosaurs that did have arms free to manipulate the world around them with, and they all look quite different to us. We have octopuses that can grab and manipulate a whole bunch of things, and they don't even have faces. Praying mantises have four legs on the ground and two above the ground, so even based on our sample size of one planet, we wouldn't expect all aliens to be bipedal, or even have legs fixed to the ground at all. Or even have hands. Octopuses don't. Even in mammals, kangaroos have two legs, and some now extinct kangaroos were even suspected to walk rather than run, and have flatter faces like humans. And they look more different to us than any Klingon or Romulan or Vulcan does. Star Trek tries to answer this conundrum in an episode of The Next Generation called The Chase, where it's revealed that an ancient alien race seeded the galaxy with their DNA after finding no race like their own among the stars. This is the explanation for why there are so many humanoid life forms in Star Trek, and it's just a migraine to make sense of. First of all, you have to accept that evolution can just work like this. That you can throw some base pairs out there that mean that billions of years later, a biped that looks just like its planters will arise, but so will a million other creatures that look nothing like them. It also paints a very deterministic view of evolution, which is at best a misunderstanding, and at worst completely unscientific. Well, not in terms of our current understanding of science anyway. It would have made sense before the work of Charles Darwin proved to be more correct than that of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, because this model of evolution sounds an awful lot like the pseudo-religious idea of the evolutionary ladder that goes way back to Aristotle. But there was an episode with TNG, which I thought they were going to set up for like a bigger storyline, but they didn't back then because it was TNG and it's very episodic. Mm -hmm. But they had these progenitors, right? Like sort oh, of like yeah, in yeah, Prometheus, yeah. if people yeah, have seen yeah. that, who basically said they planted the genetic material on a bunch of planets. And that's sort of why the humans and the Klingons, the Cardassians and the Romulans, the Vulcans, they all look fairly similar. Mm -hmm. um, is that canon? Because that was yeah. mentioned one time. That's canon. Yeah. It's canon, yeah. Oh, okay. it gets even better if you get into beta canon, because uh, <laughs> uh, just this is just a fun little thing. Um, if you read the William Shatner novels, uh, oh, great. <laughs> which, are, which are basically just like William Shatner's just ego trip, uh, where Kirk and Shatner are not different, and Kirk is like the most important character in all the galaxy. That literally happens to be the case in the second trilogy he did, where we learn like those progenitors seeded the galaxy to eventually make Kirk so that Kirk would be born to save the galaxy in this Incredible. like very specific story. So yeah, it's it's not even it's not even they're there to seed the galaxy to uh to like like make that people like themselves. But they're there to make Kirk the specific. Kirk, is, Kirk. Kirk specifically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, in, in a way, that sort of precedes the sort of a Cisco wormhole aliens thing, but much more, much more on its face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it kind of it feeds into that same thing we were just talking about, right? Like, like uh, the progenitors. It kind of feeds into this myth of there's this ideal that like the creator made, and we are all just variations on the creator. Yeah. Um, and I guess Star Trek is like doing a tad bit of a deconstruction where it's saying like humans are not the final version because right. like most versions of that would be like what kind of the William Shatner thing or like 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 again eastern white European or sorry um white European western white European like folks are like the ideal and at least yeah. Star Trek sort of like breaks it down to be like no all of these alien species are sort of variations upon yeah. that theme They're all an end point yeah yeah before Charles Darwin, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck believed in evolution as the process of inheritance of acquired characteristics. Let's take the famous example of the giraffe. The idea, according to Lamarck, was the giraffe's neck would stretch to reach leaves higher and higher on trees with each successive generation, with this intergenerational stretching modifying their necks over time, passed down through the generations as longer and longer necks. We now know that that's not how evolution works. 
for the most part. Anyway, there are some Lamarckian processes happening on the epigenetic level, but that's a bit beyond the scope of a video like this. In this way, however, you might be able to picture an organism evolving as striving for something out of reach. Lamarck believed that through this process, organisms will become more complex and climb a so-called ladder of progress, where the more complex and more advanced organisms were closer to humans and therefore closer to God, who we were, of course, made in the image of. Now, this is a massive oversimplification, of course, and it's not really fair for me to blame this on Lamarck, as he was one of the last people to think this way, and much of the core of the great chain of being dogma that these ideas come from is gone by the time we get to Lamarck's theory. The old idea of the great chain of being with lower to higher life forms was indeed a pseudo-religious idea, and has its roots all the way back to the time of the ancient Greeks, specifically Aristotle. So the idea that Lamarck and his predecessors were working from was a deeply Christian idea, where the scala naturae, as it was called in Latin, had God at the top, then the angels, then humans, animals, plants, and so on. By the time we get to Lamarckian evolutionary theory, we've stripped most of that stuff out, and we're in the mud of natural history as we know it now. But we're missing a key piece that dismantled the idea of a ladder of evolution forever, the theory of evolution by natural selection, solidified by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. The idea of progenitor aliens presented in The Chase presumes a direction for evolution, from where the progenitors planted their DNA, to the bipeds that make up the species of the Federation and beyond in Star Trek. But evolution does not have a direction. Traits survive from generation to generation by being advantageous, or at least not disadvantageous, to the survival of generations of animals. There is no evolutionary path we're on, no set start and end. And this is something Star Trek trips up on time and time again. Not just with the whole common alien ancestry thing, which is strange enough, but in other episodes too. In the episode Genesis in TNG, mm. um, and I've watched TNG twice now, so I, I, this is, wasn't just a fever dream, I know this happened. Um, there's some, I, ca I cannot for the life of me remember why, but the crew begins to de-evolve. Oh yes, Genesis, yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. And there's this moment where like, so Riker becomes like a Australopithecus, I think they say. Um, so like a, basically an ape man, for lack of a better word. And Barkley becomes a spider for some reason. Um, Troy is an, um, like a frog, um, like a horny frog. And Worf becomes like a horny predator thing. Yeah. And the whole devolving thing always pisses me off a little bit. Not, not because I don't believe some parts of it. Like some of the, one of the reasons why actually Threshold sort of worked for me is because mm -hmm. I can sort of see, um, this is going to be, everyone's going to, any, any paleo person watching is going to throw, throw bananas at me in the YouTube comments, but there are certain genes that could be turned on and off. Not enough to make yourself a salamander, but there's a certain degree to which I can see if certain things are being flicked on and off, that it'd shove you in a certain direction. That's, that's yeah, very loose. Yeah. It, yeah, but, the, but it but it goes to like Star Trek's problem of not understanding evolution of right where they yeah a lot of writers at least in Star Trek in prior times kind of had this assumption that like evolution was like a set track yeah it kind of go it kind of goes to like this is something I've been wanting to do because there's been like a whole recent controversy about like religion in Star Trek because like someone was wearing a hijab in the background of a yeah I saw that yeah. And I kind of go, like, look at that, and I haven't really talked about it a bunch, but it's like, Star Trek, like, the next generation in that sort of era kind of has a religious belief, too, that there is, like, a set course for evolution and a set course for the universe yeah. um, that we all have to adhere to. Uh, and so, like, the idea of evolution have a, having a predefined track that we, like, sort of go along. So, like, Threshold is kind of leaning into that idea of, like, humans will eventually become these, like, salamander creatures because, like, evolution will guide us there without understanding that, like, evolution is a process that relies on, like, the environmental factors right. around you. That, yeah. like, like y y y there's no set course for evolution. It's just, like, the, th the environment that you're in over the course of, like, generations will slowly, like, cause, like, like certain features to benefit and others to not and that sort of thing. And so, like, and so, like the fact that there's a predetermined track is it's nonsense for evolution. 
but it's this idea that we constantly see crop up in especially like the next generation through enterprise era of star trek of like we, 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 we have, like, a set destination for things. And that comes up in a few different ways of, like, oh, like, uh, warp drive is the end-all, be-all of civilization. So once the civilization hits warp drive, that's when we have first contact. When, like, in actuality, there are many there are many civilizations that may not develop warp drive, but still would have enough, like, for lack of a better word, and this is still a little bit of a judgmental word, and I, but for lack of a better word, like, the maturity to, like, encounter an alien species and be able to, like, handle that in an actual good way <laughs> yeah. um even without developing more drive or like something you see in like star trek enterprises dear doctor which is one of the most fucked up episodes of star trek where it's like oh this society has a predetermined evolution so we should let like this people like die from a plague because like then it will allow this other species to rise up and um, again that's like the destiny of the species and it's like no that's that's some bullshit. Like you should yeah. help these people, and then also maybe help them try to figure out like their societal uh, strife. I, I, like maybe like be like, let's help these people from not dying, and then also say, hey, maybe subjugating these people isn't cool. Uh, like you can do both of those things, um, but like it's just this idea that just constantly crops up in Star Trek that there's a predetermined track, which is like a vague sort of and i don't even think the writers would understand that like state this but like it's sort of a vague allusion to like a master plan for the universe like a god creator sort of thing um right. so like there is there is like an underpinning of religious belief within star trek uh that uh i don't even think the the writers had self were self-aware of yeah no 100 percent. and one of the things that that makes me think of is the sort of old sort of pre-Darwinian idea of evolution where you have this like ladder of creation like the old Linnaean mm -hmm. idea I think it was where like you yeah. sort of have like like lower beings that evolve into higher beings and you have like man at the top who's like close to god and yeah all right Star Trek may have decided no that's too chauvinistic so now we have salamander at the top which is uh even better and they bang and that's yeah that's the end of that the is real ladder. god the real god is the koala as we all know so like exactly. salamander is clearly closer to the koala <laughs> i mean the salamander it could be it, is it smiling do we don't know what it knows yeah yeah <laughs> you know it knows what it knows uh it's also <laughs> like it it, it also kind of like you just remind me because i'm doing a lot of like research now because i have a video that i want to do um about robot revolutions and how like hmm. robot revolutions in fiction are not actually about robots or artificial intelligence they're about how the uh, upper class of like power hierarchies is afraid of lower class people gaining sentience quote unquote and, yeah. and killing them and by mm -hmm. gaining sentience they mean like seeing themselves as full humans yeah um, developing class kind of, consciousness basically <laughs> exactly and and like yeah and so like it kind of feeds into that evolutionary bit it's like oh man is at the top and when they say man they mean like a uh, European white man at the time. Yeah. And then everyone else in sort of like variations and devolution devolutions of that. So women are a devolution, you know, people of color are a devolution, you know, women of color are even further devolution. Like it's all just like variations upon the white man ideal. Um, yeah. And so everything, and so it kind of goes down from there. In the next generation episode, Genesis, a medical anomaly causes multiple crew members to devolve. Now, devolving is not a thing that happens. You can turn certain genes on and off, but this isn't devolving. And it's not exactly something that can turn a man into an ape. You can grow chickens with teeth, for example, with some epigenetic tampering, but they haven't devolved into something non-chicken by doing that. They've just got teeth. And you can't turn that on and off like flicking on a switch. They develop teeth or they don't when they're growing. In Genesis, however, the evolutionary histories of each of the crew are so hardwired into their DNA that Commander Riker becomes a nostril epithecine, implying that the DNA of all our ancestors is stored inside of us as some sort of biological internet history, sort of Assassin's Creed-esque in that way. Now, not only would that be a huge waste, like how the hell would any of that work? Would we be storing DNA from when we were all single-celled organisms in the back of ourselves, just in case? Even besides all that, Data's cat Spot becomes an iguana. Which, I just, who signed off on this? Does anyone think that that's what cats evolved from? And aside from all of this, Barkley, a, a human, becomes a spider. What? Okay, L look at this phylogenetic tree. If you're gonna dial a human back that far, at least make the bastard a fish. That would make sense. Hell, 
even a starfish I forgive you for, but a spider? Sometimes the fiction in the term science fiction does a lot of heavy lifting, you know? Anyway, the most baffling, and yet somehow maybe my favourite, example of this weird phenomenon of determinism and evolution is the Star Trek Voyager episode Threshold. This is a... This is the one with the sex salamanders. In Threshold, Lieutenant Tom Paris works out a way to go faster than Warp 10, and this, for some reason, causes him to have trouble breathing, shouting PEPPERONI, and slowly morphing into the ultimate evolutionary destiny of humankind, which is a whiskered salamander. A salamander that fucks. How do you know this isn't the best thing that's ever happened to me? That's a possibility. Now, when I was watching this episode for the first time, I was trying to make it work, you know, in my head. Trying to earn what we call in the X-Men community a no prize. But eventually, even if you can accept the presence that Tom evolved into a salamander while just sitting on a spaceship because he started moving a bit too fast, and that's somehow just something that happens. Which it isn't. Humans aren't Pokemon. We don't evolve in a single lifetime. Evolution is, by its very nature, a multi-generational process. Well then, how did Janeway evolve into the exact same organism? And what happened to their salamander babies? Is, is no one going to spare a thought for the babies? You, you know, it's between this and Tuvix, I'm starting to think the crew on Voyager have a very relaxed attitude towards killing their nearest and dearest. Besides this very weird idea of how evolution works, the image that springs to mind the most when you think of Trek as it relates to paleontology might well be the Gorn. So the Voth design is very much like my most Star Trek aliens. So there's a little bit more um, makeup and prosthetics in it. Um, but it's, they're like, you know, they've got very like, sort of like flat face, hands, feet. I think they have three fingers. But I thought it was quite interesting to sort of contrast that with, because this idea of like the more humanoid as you get smarter idea is sort of, um, Something that I think, I mean, I think there's sort of, maybe there's a lot of bit of pushback more recently, but like it does seem sort of, sort of against the themes of the show a little bit. And I thought that was interesting con in contrast with, say, like the Gorn from the original series and later on in um, Strange New Worlds, yeah. um, because they've got much more of like um, a classic dinosaur design, you know, like with the snout and the sort of scary mm -hmm. face. And uh, I thought it was interesting that they didn't choose to go that way with the other ones who were supposed to sympathize with on its face. I knew you had some thoughts about the Gorn specifically, so I don't know well, I mean, if you... I mean, I'd be curious about your thoughts on the Gorn too, because, like, I have thoughts on how the Gorn are being used in the original series versus Strange New Worlds, and and leaving it open for Strange New Worlds to kind of correct this if they if they do it well, but even then I still have critiques, but... Um, for, so, for my critique of the Gorn is, like, the original series Gorn were very much meant to, like, be, like, we don't, there there's monstrous thing that we don't see any sort of intelligence in or anything that we can relate to, and eventually Kirk has to kind of relate to, uh, relate to them and understand, like, oh, they may appear violent, but they're actually, like, something that we can, they, we can, like, show mercy as well to and, 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 and care about. Now, there's a little bit of, like, like, colonialization sort of vibes there to a degree in that that like it's meant to represent like indigenous cultures with that with like the imagery is very much meant to represent indigenous cultures with the gorn at least in terms of like how like hollywood has understood indigenous people like oh it's like violent people that come and attack and like the like native the like native americans of old western movies um and then the whole like we can show them mercy and we can learn and so it's like it's dehumanizing indigenous cultures, but it's also meant to represent a way to like humanize people who we have in Western culture typically dehumanized through like seeing them as less than human and the Gorm sort of representing that. So like using a sort of dinosaur or like lizard aesthetic to try to talk about humanizing the other um, in our society. So that that was that's like kind of what the Gorm were originally used in the original series. And again, there's still a little like centralizing the Western cultural perspective. But it is still trying to kind of run against the grain of like monster sizing the other instead of like sort of deconstructing the idea of the monster, which was such a cool idea in the original series. Whereas Strange New Worlds is using the the using it just the like the the straight way that people everyone uses it all the time, which is just like oh, there are monsters we can't relate to, them. like the xenomorphs, these like monstrous violating creatures that just come and destroy us. Now there are hints in Strange New Worlds that they kind of have this long arc. Towards like 
seeing the Gorn as human, there's like Pike sort of represents says something like they're just monsters and like and and just just says that and, and my, my assumption is they'll probably deconstruct that later on in the series hopefully fingers crossed but it's mm. taken a long time to get there and there's not a lot of hints of it they just spent like three episodes with that the corn appeared now and just depicting them as monsters and it's like if if you want to have that arc give us a little bit more like across three episodes because like you know that you can do more with the time that you've used them for i feel like is sort of the big thing for me um but that being all being said, the thing I would actually be curious for you, because I have a friend of mine who is so angry about the Gorn uh, <laughs> in Strange Worlds because of their reproductive cycle, um, mm. because they like do you have the xenomorph style thing, um, and I know your paleontologist is not necessarily like a biologist. I guess would be the the, the correct scientist who would do that. I, I I'm, I'm, know, a, but... I'm a mishmash. You know these these days you get into one, you're basically getting into like every field around that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's because like my friends sort of like they would technically have to be like a, for them to work like as the like xenomorph sort of thing, like where they like chest burster and they like create these little baby gorn. They would have to be like a haploid, I believe, a haploid life cycle, but mm. that would make no sense because to create like a sentient species that like grows up that fast the amount of energy needed to do that like couldn't be done as a haploid life cycle i think it was like the way my friend sort of explained it to me i i'm still trying to wrap my head completely around because that's not my field of expertise <laughs> but it was just one of those my friend gets so angry about how the gorn specifically are shown in star trek and i kind of toss it up to like star trek biology has never really made much sense yeah. But, but, uh, but and I will I get to understand. that in a different way later on because yeah. I have some questions. Um, but, oh, yeah. Yeah. If we want to get to evolution in Star Trek, we can talk about that bullshit. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, that exactly. also ties into distant origin. Because exactly. Star Trek does not understand evolution in the slightest. The Gorn are not dinosaurs, they're just aliens. But they are depicted looking like a typical movie monster villain. Basically, a dinosaur suit. In the original series episode Arena, they are used as a pretty textbook don't judge a book by its cover sort of lesson for Captain Kirk and a test of whether humans have moved past their violent past by another alien species, the Metrons. In Strange New Worlds, they use pretty much stripped of this context as a movie monster, specifically as an homage to Alien, which I'm not super mad at. But if I knew more about parasitology, I'm sure I would be. Thankfully, I'm less concerned with haploid and diploid life forms. I'm more still wondering is that is that thing a dinosauroid? Okay, this this is what I was getting to with all this. This is the culmination, the ladder of evolution with humans at the top, a deterministic evolution with a set bipedal human-like goal. The Silurians from Doctor Who. It was all leading to this, baby. It was all leading to the fucking Voth. Oh, you thought I was going to talk about the Gorn? The Gorn are fine. The Gorn are fine. They're over there doing their own thing. No, they don't make sense. But I don't care. I'm here to talk about the hadrosaurs that are also aliens. And somehow also bipeds with spaceships half a galaxy away from Earth. In a past life, I was a paleontologist. So oh, hell yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. So when I was watching, I was going through Voyager and eventually you get to Distant Origin, um, which um, if for those of you who don't know, this is the episode where they discover that there are uh, dinosaur aliens Mm -hmm. um off in a distant corner of the galaxy um who evolved from i think they said like some common ancestor of like hadrosaurids or something there's this whole thing from like the 80s there's this idea of the dinosauroid which is this very arrogant sort of idea that if mm -hmm. smart dinosaurs kept evolving and didn't die from the meteor they'd end up looking like us and yeah, they get yeah. like they yeah yeah so you can see you'll see this idea like the sort of star trek alien prototype of like the two legged two legs two hands big brain flat mm -hmm. face um this was criticized for being like sort of anthropomorphic kind of arrogant to assume everything just ends up looking like humans yeah yeah it's humans the center of the galaxy everything eventually becomes us because we're the pinnacle of creation sort of bullshit. exactly yeah. exactly so speaking like in that's in that same vein one of the things that really I want, like, I I love the Voth in as much as, like, their good story device. But there's the, obviously, like, there's a whole, oh, they're on a, they're on an isolated continent. That's why we don't have any evidence of them. There's no evidence of them anywhere for some reason. Where was this continent? Don't worry about it. Just, yeah, just, look, just, it's fine. Yeah. just forget about that. Atlantis, and then um, they, sure. <laughs> there's a scene, which for any other alien, I would have found really cool, where they just have this little heat lamp. 
and the flies are buzzing around it. And one of them gets to this, like, a projectile tongue out and eats a fly. And as someone who studied this exact dinosaur before, this made me so angry. <laughs> I can't explain why. <laughs> it's so stupid. And they said it's from somewhere else. They could have plausibly had some weird genetic thing. But, like, that's not how dinosaur tongues would work. I mean, like, the, like, the only thing I was thinking, like, because this is, like, based on, like, obviously, like, a like a Jackson chameleon or whatever, where they have their long tongue mm. that goes halfway down their like stomach. Yeah. And then they yeah. spit they spit it out really quickly and get it back. A lot of people conflate lizards with all that stuff. It's fine, fine, whatever. And then I was thinking about the I was trying to think, is there an example in birds that is like that? And the only thing I could think of was a woodpecker's tongue goes like wraps around its skull like a bunch of times. But huh. it, even that doesn't do that, it just sort of sticks out further. So the more I thought about it, the worse it got. And it's completely stupid. It makes no sense. Like it's like as a writer, as like a fiction writer, I understand that it doesn't matter. As a scientist, that gave me a migraine. <laughs> if you devour dinosaur books in the encyclopedia like I did when I was a kid, then you might recognize this green alien looking creature. When I was growing up, it was put side by side with a dinosaur Trodon. It's claiming that Trodon, with its large brain, high intelligence, and semi-grasping fingers, would, given enough time, evolve into something that looked very much like a human, filling the same ecological niche that we fill. These days, we call this dinosaur Stenon. Come on, guys. L listen, uh, paleontology community, I love you. Think of some fucking easier to say names. Like, it's not that hard. There are a lot of syllables to use. There's, there's no need to do this. Stenoc Sten Stenonicosaurus. Stenonicosaurus. It's called Stenonicosaurus. Fine. Kids like dinosaurs, just call it fucking Jeff. Why not? Anyway, these days we call this dinosaur Stenonicosaurus. But nevertheless, this cryptid is a weirdly persistent meme in paleo circles. Not taken seriously by professionals anymore, but still often a curiosity in books and the occasional museum. This walking thought experiment is the brainchild of one Dale Russell, a one-time curator at the National Museum of Canada, and it has haunted my nightmares ever since. From my old dinosaur books, which were written in a way that made it look like Trodon had two forms, like some sort of ancient Pokemon that changed when you held an item, to a children's TV show called Dino Sapien, where this monster straight from my nightmares lived in the forests of Canada and even had a name. For those interested in this phenomenon, please read the article Dinosauroids Revisited, Revisited by Darren Nash, which is where I found out about this TV show, and the big popular science names that have since come out in support of the idea which I think reveals a lot more about how people like Richard Dawkins, for example, think, than it does about anything actually pertaining to paleontology. As a warning, however, this is an article from 2012, and thus it hasn't been updated to get rid of fellow trans paleontologist and author Riley Black's dead name. I think Scientific American. Very cool. So keep that in mind. From the article itself, pretty much everyone interested in dinosaurs, in the history of life, or in such matters as the evolution of intelligence and or brain size, will be familiar with the various speculations on humanoid dinosaurs that have made their way into the literature. During the 1970s, it became widely accepted that one group of Cretaceous theropods, the Trodontids, known at the time as Sauronithoidids, were relatively big-brained, with encephalization quotients overlapping those of modern birds and mammals. In reality, Trodontids might therefore have been as smart as bustards, emus, or possums. The notion that these dinosaurs were big-brained and therefore intelligent seems to have given rise to a myth, however, that these were really smart dinosaurs, approaching the anthropoid level in terms of their ability to solve problems and understand the world around them. At least one book on Earth mysteries and the paranormal states that some dinosaurs were probably as intelligent as primitive man, a quote almost certainly based on studies of Trodontids. In Jurassic Park, the book that is, the Dromaeosaurids are said to be intellectually on par with chimpanzees. Inspired by new data on Trodontid brain size, Carl Sagan speculated about intelligent dinosaurs in The Dragons of Eden and posed the question, what if non-avian dinosaurs hadn't begun extinct? If Cretaceous forms were already so smart, what would have happened, given another 60-odd million years of evolution? His question seems to have inspired a number of science fiction stories that appeared soon afterward. Among the most important data on Trodontid brain size was that published by Dale Russell, 
then of the National Museum of Natural Sciences in Ottawa. On on to anatomy and functional morphology, in 1982 he did a rather peculiar thing. Cooperating with taxidermist and model maker Ron Sagan, he produced the article Reconstruction of the Small Cretaceous Theropod Sternonicosaurus inequalis and a Hypothetical Dinosaur. While part of the article discussed how a life-sized model Sternonicosaurus was reconstructed and made, the rest was devoted to a thought experiment in which Russell and Seguin reconstructed a hypothetical evolved trodontid. They reasoned that an enlarged brain would result in a shortened facial region, and they used the cranial proportions of a chick embryo as a guide. Based on the idea that trodontids have a reduced dentition compared to other theropods, and the notion that big-brained primates have a reduced dentition compared to smaller brain forms, they made the dinosaur root toothless. They further argued that a big-brained head would need to be supported directly over the body, and that a short neck and vertical human-like posture would evolve. The vertical posture meant goodbye to the tail, reduced to a stump in the dinosauroid, and the need to give birth to big-headed babies led them to imagine a broad human-like pelvis. Dinosauroids were imagined to be viviparous, so the model is equipped with a navel. Because human legs obviously work well for humans, Russell and Sagan proposed that human legs would also work well for a human-like dinosauroid, and the feet of the dinosauroid are not tridactyl and clawed, as usually shown in drawings, but four-toed, with nails rather than claws. Apologies in advance to Darren Nash, who I'm pretty sure I'm mutuals with on a bunch of social media sites. Darren, I know that's not how you talk. Do you see what's happening here, though? The imprinting of human traits onto the idea of intelligence? What need would this dinosauroid have for human legs? Dinosaurs could walk perfectly fine, more than fine even. Bipedal dinosaurs were around for hundreds of millions of years. Human legs have only been able to support bipedality for, well, it depends who you ask, but certainly less than 10 million years. The head directly over the neck, resulting in a short neck and vertical posture, might seem logical to us as humans, coming from exactly that body plan. But birds are plenty smart, and they have a posture much more similar to their ancestors like Senonophosaurus than that of humans. In fact, if you have a tail, you don't have the problem humans have with balancing our heads if they hang forward. But of course, the dinosauroids don't have a tail, because they have a vertical posture. Perhaps most bizarre of all, the addition of a broad human-like pelvis for giving birth to big-headed babies, and the ability to give birth to live young, was incorporated into this model. The thing is, though, the human birthing process is very dangerous. Much more dangerous than, say, laying an egg that developed quickly into very large animals, like with dinosaurs. And I can't for the life of me picture how animals that could reproduce perfectly well would evolve a potentially deadly method of giving birth like that. Especially because one of the benefits of giving birth to life young is not having to spend lots of time looking after eggs. Well, human babies are born underdeveloped compared to a lot of other mammals, precisely because if they got too big, they would be even more difficult to give birth to, so you lose that benefit completely. Frankly, I'm kind of disappointed Carl Sagan was into this idea. When I think of Carl Sagan, I think about the pale blue dot monologue from Cosmos. The idea that we humans, our entire civilization, our species, our planet, is just a speck of dust in the vast universe. Unimportant. One of billions. The pale blue dot, for me, is a beautiful tearing down of the idea of human superiority. Of the arrogance of our species. That we are somehow at the top of a ladder of evolution. Second only to God himself. In the end, we are just one of millions of species, on one of millions of planets, orbiting one of millions of stars in one of millions of galaxies, in a vast and unknowably complex universe. So why would this dinosaur turn into something just like us because it happened to be smart? I expect this from Richard Dawkins, who spoke in favour of this idea in the past, but Carl Sagan? Come on, man. But it's not just Carl Sagan or, God forbid, Richard Dawkins that have given this idea much more credence than it deserves. It's been promoted on the BBC's documentary series Horizon, there's that children's TV show I mentioned with a dinosaur called Eno, and numerous other examples of this frankly human-centric and arrogant idea that smart animals just naturally tend towards becoming human throughout a ton of paleontology-adjacent media. In a quote from Riley Black that Nace uses in the article I cited earlier, she describes the dinosauroid in a way that might sound familiar to you if you paid attention to my critiques of evolution as portrayed in Star Trek earlier. In Riley's book, Written in Stone, 
the hidden secrets of fossils and the story of life on Earth. She described how belief in the inevitability of a humanoid dinosaur betrays belief in the idea that the emergence of Homo sapiens is woven into the very fabric of the universe itself. And that's just it, isn't it? This idea speaks to a deterministic vision of evolution that is unscientific, or at least un-Darwinian. Just like with the progenitors in Star Trek, and the same idea that surfaces in Prometheus, the unfortunately shit alien prequel, life is hard-coded to eventually result in humanity, or something very much like it. A human, a dinosauroid, a Silurian, a Vulcan, perhaps even a Voth. As Inesh says in the article, with this in mind, my feeling in dinosauroids and intelligent theropods and so on is that if they were to evolve, they wouldn't look like scaly or feathery people, but would instead be far more normal from the theropod point of view. A horizontal body posture, not a vertical one. Digitigrade feet, not plantigrade ones. A long tail, not a reduced one. And Nish and Black are both right. Any less than this is an admission of a human-centric view of the universe. An admission, at least subconsciously, if not outright, of human superiority. That intelligence is our domain, and anything unlike us cannot possibly compete on our level. We, after all, top the Scala Naturae. Above us are only angels and the gods themselves. This, of course, if you think too hard about it, has some colonialist implication. It might remind you of some theories of eugenics or race science that are best left in the dustbin of history. A lot of these theories came about the same time that capitalism and slavery were, were becoming the global systems that would dominate the world. But even besides that, this arrogance of humanity is the one smart template, the one possible answer, is very un-Star Trek. Your genetic markers appear not only in humans, but in hundreds of species throughout our history. That's a lot of random convergence. If you take a look at the data... We have. The data isn't in question. Your interpretation is... Distant Origin is the 23rd episode of the third season of Star Trek Voyager. At this point in the Trek canon, we've had the Gorn, we've had the Progenitors making the case that every little pool of life in the universe will eventually become humanoid, and we've even passed Threshold, which means that unfortunately, we also know that eventually all life that becomes human-like, and therefore cool and good and smart and spacefaring, will eventually become salamanders. Salamanders remember, but fuck. Unaware of their eventual horny amphibious fates, however, the story of Distant Origin follows a pair of Voth as they investigate the story of their species' evolution. These Voth, who are reptile-like humanoids, are paleontologists. They are deep into the Delta Quadrant. Humans are from the Alpha Quadrant, but luckily for them, Voyager got flung into the Delta Quadrant in the first episode of the series, hence the name. There are... Vo voyaging. Anyway, the, the Voth are investigating a controversial theory of their species' of evolution, the titular distant origin theory that speculates the Voth are from a faraway planet and travelled to the Delta Quadrant millions of years ago. This is a little nod to the panspermia hypothesis of how life came to Earth. If you want to look that up, I'll leave a link in the description. The beliefs of these Voth run counter to their species' core mythology about themselves, their vision of Voth superiority, that they were the first intelligent species to evolve the Delta Quadrant, and that they therefore were superior to other forms of intelligent life, particularly mammalian life. This episode is, you might be able to tell, in part a metaphor for the creationism versus evolution debates back on Earth, about religious dogma and the denial of science in favour of a supremacist view of the world, as well as certain ideas of eugenics. Distant Origin, and I sort of love this, uses the instance of a dinosaur that became an alien as an argument against human supremacist thinking and the other supremacist thinkings that are linked to it. The crew of Voyager eventually help the Voth in their investigation and discover, as they suspected, that the Voth and humans have a common ancestor, that they are both from Earth. And though on the holodeck the animal most closely related to the Voth that we know of is shown to be a Parasaurolophus, a hadrosaur, not a theropod dinosaur like Stenonychosaurus, the Voth are shown to be something very similar to a dinosauroid, hidden from our science by being isolated on a continent that sunk under the Earth's crust like an extremely metal version of the Atlantis myth. More metal, I mean. A continent sink under the sea is pretty fucking metal by itself. Now we'll be 
obviously the idea of a secret continent with an eventual spacefaring civilization that left absolutely no trace is ridiculous. As is the notion that a Hadrosaur would have a close cousin that looks like, well, well like this. Like a Voth, like a Silurian, like a Dinosauroid. But the story itself is actually fantastic, and it's the reason I wrote this video. I couldn't stop thinking about how neat it was to use this ridiculous idea. This... This is a strong word. This insult to science and testament to human arrogance that is the Dinosauroid, and to use it in this story about battling supremacist worldviews, fighting against religious dogma that places us as supreme and others as lesser. The more I thought about it, the more masterful it seemed. But it still has the Dinosauroid in. And if I was going to talk about it, I needed to talk about how we got here. How Star Trek had previously painted evolution as deterministic and human-centric. How the Dinosauroid gave away those supremacist tendencies in our science, in our science communicators, even in our heroes. And how this ideology shows up in other series. Series with aliens who look just like humans, and which only use dinosaurs as a prop to a story. A piece of set dressing. The smart aliens who look just like us. And this, in a way, brings me back to Jurassic Park and what it has in common with Distant Origin. For me, they both teach us a lesson in how to write good science fiction, where both the science part and the fiction part of the genre are used to their maximum effectiveness. Stories that entertain and teach and provoke. Stories that make us think Stories that reflect back on us and our species, on how science is used and misused in our own time, through a cracked mirror, an abstraction that somehow gives our reality clarity. Much like when systems of supremacy are challenged in real life, those challenging the dogma of the ruling class are punished. Despite proving once and for all that humans exist, by bringing Commander Chakotay as proof onto the Voth ship, the Voth scientists are divided, with one turning against his friend, telling the leader of the Voth that his research was flawed, for which he is praised. Only one scientist remains, one still willing to challenge the dogma. He is sentenced to life imprisonment, along with the crew of Voyager, at which he ultimately relents unwilling to risk those his society has deemed inferior. Those whose existence challenges the idea that the Voth are unique, supreme, atop the evolutionary ladder. He capitulates and disavows his life's work, his research, his ideology, everything. Preventing the suffering of those he has been raised to see as inferior, ultimately, trumps everything he has worked for, even revealing the truth. The best episodes of Star Trek often deal with similar themes as that of Distant Origin, of empathy in the alien, finding common humanity, of overlooking differences and understanding each other. Ultimately, one of the core messages of Star Trek as a franchise is of kinship and brotherhood as the keys to a future worth living in. A future worth making. Despite the ways that Star Trek's view of evolutionary science has mangled that message, it still comes through. To make it to the stars, Earth had to unite. To leave petty squabbles and differences behind. To become a common and peaceful humanity. And as the series goes further and further into the future, these lessons become even more important. Vulcans, Andorians, even Klingons and Ferengi whose ideals seem different, even antithetical to humanity's own, are embraced and recognised. Our differences celebrated. Our diversity part of what keeps us together, even as we are all just as special, just as precious just as worthy of a life that fulfills us and is, with any luck, beyond suffering. Star Trek fans might find this comparison a tad heretical, but I'd compare how Distant Origin deals with humanity, science and dogma to one of the best episodes of the entire franchise. 
the measure of a man. Yes, measure of a man is better, but they both speak to similar values. In the measure of a man, Commander Data, an android and beloved member of the Enterprise crew, is forced to prove his humanity when a cyberneticist tries to make the case to Starfleet for dismantling him to figure out how he works to advance the science of the Federation at the cost of a life that he does not believe is a person. This is one of the greatest episodes of television of all time, I would argue. And in the process of arguing for the humanity of Commander Data, Captain Picard reveals the human supremacist argument of his opponent, making the case that the plan to take Data into custody and study him against his will would be tantamount to slavery, and demonstrates how arbitrary the designation of personhood can be. Data has been denied, but he meets many of the criteria to define sentient life, and importantly, no one can measure consciousness. The distinction between humanity and the android left to plead for his freedom is meaningless if you do not consider humans superior to Data because he is a machine. This episode makes me cry every time I watch it. And Distant Origin very much does not, but both challenge our core assumptions and compel us to consider our collective humanity. What makes one being superior to another? nothing. What gives one the right to capture another and experiment on them to further their own kind? Nothing. The scientist in The Measure of a Man was, to paraphrase Jurassic Park, so preoccupied with whether he could that he didn't stop to think if he should. In a similar way in which The Measure of a Man uses the example of an android to make an argument about a common humanity in the real world about the cruelty and arbitrariness of discrimination, Distant Origin uses what is essentially a dinosauroid to make the very case against the ideology that created the dinosauroid in the first place. A human-centric worldview, a narrative that we are the centre of the universe, and all evolution ultimately leads to us, the pinnacle. It, like Jurassic Park, uses its paleontological elements as a core driver of how its themes play out in the story. And just as Jurassic Park uses its dinosaurs to challenge our idea that we have, or deserve, to have mastery over nature, the persistence of the idea of the dinosauroid in our public consciousness feeds into the themes of the most famous dinosaur movie of all time. Not only are we misusing science, we cannot even separate our science from our own egos. Jurassic Park in the movie was a monument to one man's ego, and as much as the idea might try and disguise itself as something otherwise, the dinosauroid is much the same. And to truly advance our knowledge as a species, to truly understand our world, we need to leave that arrogance behind. And as much as I love all of these shows and movies I've talked about today, that means moving past a world where our idea of life worth preserving, befriending, even loving, is restricted to beings that look and think like us. Thanks for watching. Prove to the court that I am sentient. This is absurd. We all know you're sentient. So I am sentient, but Commander Data is not. That's right. Uh -huh. Bye. Hey, thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you like this video, why not like it, leave a comment, subscribe, and tell your friends about it. I am uh, very poor right now, so if you have a few coins burning a hole in your pocket, and you'd like to see a trend like me down on her luck, why not? Help me get out of my massive, horrifying overdraft and send me some money. You can give one-time donations on Coffee or PayPal, links below as always. Or better yet, send it to my Patreon. We get exclusive videos access to the members only discord my nintendo switch friend code early videos exclusive content such as long form interviews with princess weeks rosen quotes and this conversation you just saw a bit of with jesse gender you get the full thing of that in addition to all that good stuff though you'll also if you sign up get your name read out at the end of each video just like these lovely people scully jan lloyd de luciente stephanie jason Cribbit, raven tempest Shield Vaden, Robin Podolsky, Exploding Turtle, Casual Observer, Terry Roberts, Manta Ray, Courtney Burmack, Sleepy Slug, Philippa Tabrogger, Belligerent Kitten, Summer Piglet, Brain Douche, 
4IS, Artie Wolf, Hayden Gala, Greg Noble, Deanna McMillan, Caroline Regalado, Alexander Lilly, PJ Lisbrill, Howard Lott, Lara Van Loon, Nerony Escarjan, and Joey Cobalt. I love you all. Have a lovely time. I mean, your channel is the reason I'm watching Voyager to begin with. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I, I made it through Threshold somehow. I knew that was coming. Um, oh, see, like, Threshold what? is fun. Threshold is fun. Everyone shits at Threshold. I laugh at Threshold. I, I loved. Time. I loved it. It was so stupid. I, I, it was like, um, you know, when I was watching Jurassic World for the first time, and I was like, five minutes in, I was like, oh, this isn't going to be a good movie, and then you could just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like Robert Duncan McNeil is just, it's just going for it, and I'm here for it. Just like a pepperoni, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, yes, I'm here. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Was that ad lib? I don't even know. Was that in the script? I have no idea. If someone wrote that in a script, I'm, I'm, Brandon Braga would have been the one to do it because he was wrote that script, and I would that that would be a choice. But I think he probably did. 